Hello and welcome to this commentary where I am joined by There's your Marcus cube. Marcus House. Hey, hey, how are you going everyone? <laughs> yes, and me and Marcus House are also joined by Matt Kerman there, who is courageously boarding this SS2, which I have dubbed uh, the Bezant. Um, before we really getting before really getting underway with this commentary though, I'd just like to point out that uh, our ascent from Kerbin will be played at ludicrously fast speed so we can keep the video nice and concise. I've made other SSTO videos in which I discuss uh, flight plans of big SSTOs more in depth. I would point you in the direction of my 60 seat minorless SSTO to ELU uh, video for my most recent recent commentary on the subject. Anyway, now that that's out of the way, I can properly welcome you, Marcus, to my channel, and of course, uh, welcome you, the viewers, to this series. Yes, thank you, man. It's uh, it, it's awesome, man. It's awesome being here, and yes, very, very, very big thanks to all the collaborators that have joined us with this uh, huge endeavour, I will say. We've been working on this, what now, Matt, for three months or something? Yeah, absolutely. It's been great to work with some of these uh, creators on the project. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I don't think anything of this scale has uh, really been attempted in the KSB community before. So, yeah, it was an honour to uh, host the playlist. And, yeah, it's been awesome having you uh, help with organising this, Matt. Certainly couldn't have done anything like this by myself. So, yeah, very, very big thanks, mate. It's been wicked. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, here we are just pumping fuel, by the way, for those of you that might have noticed the Delta V in the top right suddenly shoot up it's because I was pumping fuel into the main tanks which is why that's happening uh, yeah so if we've timed all of this right and all this has worked properly then all the episodes should now be out for you to binge watch just like a Netflix show but obviously this is much more entertaining than a Netflix show absolutely <laughs> Uh, yeah, so at this point, some of you may be confused as to what I'm doing, since this is meant to be a MUN station, yet here I am flying my SSTO to Minmus, and that's because while my Kerbal is waiting for some crewmates, he may as well crack on with some science. So we're going to go and just grab some surface samples from the Minmus and see how they compare to MUN surface samples. And yes, that means that we're going to have to in fact land this ship on the MUN as well in order to get the samples from there too. Wow, this is an awesome undertaking to do all of this in the one flight. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose. I mean, like, the actual module I made is not the most impressive because A, I wanted it to just be kind of the core module. I didn't want to sort of, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to just dominate the station by accident. I wasn't really sure what other people's modules would look like. So I thought I'd just make something nice and small so people can just dock to it. But uh, yes, in fact, this SSTO has more than enough fuel to do a joint and minmus and mun landing without refueling. Uh, it has over 5 kilometers per second of Delta V available to it from low curb in orbit. Um, so that's because of this surplus of fuel, you'll see me pulling off maneuvers that are horribly inefficient and just downright lazy. You'll notice my actual ejection, well not ejection from Kerbin, but my Kerbin to Minmus transfer burn actually ended up going through a bit of Kerbin's atmosphere and it was it was very inefficient. But, you know, I had enough it fuel. It is the Kerbal so way though. I, <laughs> I was being lazy. <laughs> Tis the Kerbal way! I just didn't want to keep this, uh, I just wanted to speed up the flight a bit just because I didn't want to keep this video too, not too drawn out, which is why I'm kind of taking the quick approach. You'll notice there's quite a bit of oxidizer left in those tanks. I do end up using all of that just to actually land on the moon quickly, so... <laughs> yes. But, um, so what's our mission at Minmus? Where, where, what are we actually heading to do here? <laughs> so, when we're landing on Minmus, uh, Generally, any lander for Minmus, okay, a good place to land is the greater flats, or the lesser flats, I guess, just because they are, as the name would suggest, very flat. So, it's not so much a big deal for landers on landing legs, but for an aircraft that takes off and lands horizontally, uh, it's a pretty ideal situation. Obviously, we won't have this fortune when we land on the MUN, but if we can get it on Minmus, we may as well. So, just doing a quick, gentle <laughs> touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. <laughs> I mean, the footage is played at about four times speed here, so it does look a bit more violent than it was. They're playing a normal speed now. But uh, yes, then we can go ahead and do the honours of planting our flag. Um, we can collect our science as well. Obviously, this is a sandbox save, so any samples are more spiritual rather than actually useful. And then Matt Kerman can go ahead and board the SSTO again. And then we can take off and the greater flats actually make a great runway surface. Um, oh, there we are, just firing the engine. I was meant to have those two monitors. Ah, they're Mellon very engines. cool, actually. They're very cool. Yeah, I was meant to have them toggled by an action group, but I forgot to set that up. So, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We didn't end up needing them. But, well, I mean, we didn't end up needing both on. So we are just going to time warp up to periapsis and circularize our orbit from there. Um, ordinarily, I think it would make more sense to do 
a Mun landing first, then do a Minmus landing afterwards, but given that our final destination needs to be Mun orbit, it made more sense to do Minmus first in this instance. Um, but yes, um, some of our viewers might not be uh, aware of who you are, Marcus, so did you want to, um, well, you know, like what's, what, 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 do you, what do you consider your specialty to be in the world well, of Well, yes, I guess program? my channel is probably best described as uh, full of all sorts of random crafts and missions. There's not really any rhyme or reason uh, to my channel at all, sadly. Uh, not like your channel, which is full of SSTO awesomeness. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you're a little bit of anything and everything, really. And uh, we've actually we have quite a nice diversity um, for all the collaborators on this series, really, in the uh, following missions from this. And at the time of filming this episode, we of course had no idea what was going to evolve from this. I had no idea what I was going to do in part two. One thing I do know, though, from my channel is that a lot of people quite enjoyed the super lifter. So yeah, I might need to do something with that. Yes, I do actually remember that video doing pretty well at the time. But yes, uh, as you probably worked out at this point, the premise of this series is that the save file got passed around and everyone took an opportunity to add their own little module to a station. So Marcus House is going after me and you'll be pleased to hear that I do not feature in his commentary. <laughs> so, you know, he's got that going for him. <laughs> yes, so here we are landing at the Mun. Now, I could have done the suicide burn properly, but I didn't and realised I was coming in far too fast, so I just fired up the uh, rapier engine again and used up some of our oxidizer because again, we have more than enough Delta V to do this mission as inefficiently as we can, so it wasn't really a problem. And, and for, those, uh, for those wondering, I'm assuming that the um, air brakes are out simply because you've got the brakes on the wheels going. <laughs> yeah, you know what, I was having a, I was having a just a conversation with uh, Brad Wistons actually about this, how the air brakes are absolutely useless for SSTOs because when you're going in and everything is getting hot, the air brakes are always the first thing to over to explode from overheating. Like they're completely useless for SSTOs, they're only good for terrestrial aircraft and then, well why do you need air brakes on that unless you're doing a really agile fighter. Anyway, that was my little niggle with those. Uh, <laughs> luckily we managed to land on this kind of natural slope to kick us back ah, into orbit. Nice. We can use the, some of our oxidizer again to get us into orbit. I actually um, pass, I ended up passing uh, our apoapsis now to start pointing up again before slamming into the ground. So it wasn't the most perfect takeoff, but it worked. Yeah, look, this is the problem with those nerve rocket motors. I mean, they are fantastically efficient, but when it really comes down to it, the thrust of weight on those things is just terrible. It takes so long to obtain orbital speed. Sometimes it really sucks. <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah, as I was saying, like my bigger SSTOs, like my ELO SSTO and one I'm working on at the moment, have um, six nuclear engines, or even one of them has eight nuclear engines. So yeah, you do need a lot to get the thrust to weight ratio unfortunately but yeah here we are circularizing at the moon and well we can get it a little bit more circular actually so we'll do a few sort of fine tweaks to get it perfectly equatorial we can do a little bit with the inclination in there but we can just skip a little bit ahead through all of that and get to actually deploying our module itself so the core module what is it that you're dropping here matt Yes, uh, well we can open up the bay doors and have a look and actually go ahead and deploy the module. Uh, it is fairly modest in its design since it was my plan to just have this serve as, you know, kind of central core for the space station. So its main function is really just to, you know, house some reaction wheels and battery banks and, you know, just to supply the rest of the station. I, I hope that the, uh, the method of delivery and the rest of this mission's profile and all of that make up for its somewhat simple nature and you know, kind of, I want to say underwhelming, but that makes it sound a lot worse than I would want it to sound. <laughs> uh, and let's just move away from that. But here we are, just Matt can go ahead and board the module, and there we go, there's the first piece of the station. And there we go, Ooh, Matt Kerman <laughs> coming in to uh, basically sit there on his lonesome. Uh, he's going to be aboard up here while uh, my episode is getting thrown together, which of course will be streamed immediately after this one, but there was quite a delay uh, in real time when we were putting all this together. Yeah, I want to say the best part of three months, wasn't it? So uh, you guys have it lucky. The, the viewers, I mean. I mean, this could be a disaster. I don't know what the reception of this will be like, but hopefully people will enjoy the series. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Yes, but now we can depart from the Mun and set a course back to the runway. I've um, 
but we are just leaving. Again, we have a lot of fuel left over. Look over. 1,200 meters per second of Delta V, so... Loads of fuel to play around with, so I didn't really think about where I was doing my burn to lower the periapsis, so... Uh, I ended up lowering my periapsis to approximately 36 kilometers above sea level, and we can brace for re-entry. I didn't... There was no rhyme or reason to having 36 kilometers. I basically just aimed for 40 and overshot. So, um... Yeah, we can uh, reactivate all our control surfaces, which were just deactivated for aesthetic purposes, and also just pump some of the fuel into the front tanks, just to try and keep the craft a little bit more balanced in flight. I mean, it would be fine, but it would have a bit of... It would be a lot more unstable if we didn't do that. And then, of course, we can just to do, retract these solar panels and go straight in for re-entry. I kind of did this sort of uh, spinning and flipping motion to help distribute the heat across the airframe and reduce the chance of things exploding. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, as you can see, I got pretty lucky with my initial entry into Kerman's atmosphere and it put us very close to the space centre itself. Ordinarily, I'd air break to the point where my apoapsis level was out at 70 or 80 kilometres above sea level and then go on to circularise my orbit and plot a proper descent from there. But, hey, I saw the opportunity to skip all that, so here we are, brute forcing our way to the Kerbal Space Centre. Ah, that's center, brilliant. So. <laughs> Just doing a little puff of the engines. And there we go. I'd like to say this happens every time, but... It doesn't. <laughs> yes, quick save, quick load is our uh, friend, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I guess this is kind of the commentary coming to an end. Did you have any closing thoughts or anything like that? Uh, just another big thanks to everybody. And, of course, everybody that's watching, thank you for watching. Please share and, and watch the rest of the playlist. All the collaborators in this have, have spent a huge amount of time putting everything together. So, yeah, uh, check it all out. I think that's my little textbook landing, by the way, just there. Yeah, I think that summed up the video pretty well. So, I guess, without further ado, we can pass you over to Marcus House's channel, where he'll be... Well, I won't say what it is. I don't know if that's a secret yet. But uh, yes, thank you for watching this. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the series. Yes, absolutely. Do enjoy, everybody. I will see you in part two. Uh, in the meantime, of course, Matt will be waiting patiently for Marcus Kerman to arrive. Absolutely. So I hope you guys all enjoy. And the next video is on the left of the screen right now. And the full playlist is on the right. So click those and enjoy. See you in the next video. Okay.